Braiding sweetgrass, indigenous wisdom, scientific knowledge, and the teachings of plants. Written by Robin Wall Kimmerer, read by Sen Naomi Kier Schultz, June 28th, 2022. Section 1. Planting sweetgrass. Sweetgrass is best planted not by seed, but by putting roots directly in the ground. Thus, the plant is passed from hand to earth to hand, across years and generations. Its favored habitat is sunny, well-watered meadows. It thrives along disturbed edges. Part 1. Sky Woman Falling In winter, when the green earth lies resting beneath a blanket of snow, this is the time for storytelling. The storytellers begin by calling upon those who came before, who passed the stories down to us, for we are only messengers. In the beginning there was the sky world, and she fell like a maple seed, pirouetting on an autumn breeze. A column of light streamed from a hole in the sky world, marking her path where only darkness had been before. It took her a long time to fall. In fear or maybe hope, she clutched a bundle tightly in her hand. Hurtling downward, she saw only dark water below, but in that emptiness there were many eyes gazing up at the sudden shaft of light. They saw there a small object, a mere dust moat in the beam. As it grew closer, they could see it was a woman, arms outstretched, long black hair billowing behind as she spiraled towards them. The geese nodded at one another and rose together from the water, in a wave of goose music. She felt the beat of their wings as they flew beneath to break her fall. Far from the only home she'd ever known, she caught her breath at the warm embrace of soft feathers as they gently carried her downward. And so it began. The geese could not hold the woman above the water for much longer, and so they called a council to decide what to do. Resting on their wings, she saw them all gather, Loons, otters, swans, beavers, fish of all kinds. A great turtle floated in their midst and offered his back for her to rest upon. Gratefully, she stepped from the goose wings onto the dome of his shell. The others understood that she needed land for her home and discussed how they might serve her need. The deep divers among them had heard of mud at the bottom of the water and agreed to go find some. Loon dove first, but the distance was too far, and after a long while, he surfaced with nothing to show for his efforts. One by one, the other animals offered to help. Otter, beaver, sturgeon. But the depth, the darkness, and the pressures were too great for even the strongest of swimmers. They returned gasping for air, with their heads ringing. Some did not return at all. Soon, only little muskrat was left, the weakest diver of all. He volunteered to go while the others looked on doubtfully. His small legs flailed as he worked his way downward, and he was gone a very long time. They waited and waited for him to return, fearing the worst for their relative, and before long, a stream of bubbles rose with the small, limp body of the muskrat. He had given his life to aid this helpless woman. But then, the others noticed that his paw was tightly clenched, and when they opened it, there was a small handful of mud. Turtle said, Here, put it on my back, and I will hold it. Sky Woman bent and spread the mud with her hands across the shell of the turtle. Moved by the extraordinary gifts of the animals, she sang in thanksgiving and began to dance, her feet caressing the earth. The land grew and grew as she danced her thanks, from the dab of mud on Turtle's back until the whole earth was made, not by Sky Woman alone, but from the alchemy of all the animal's gifts, coupled with her deep gratitude. Together, they formed what we know today as Turtle Island, our home. Like any good guest, Sky Woman had not come empty-handed. The bundle was still clutched in her hand. When she toppled from the hole in the sky world, she had reached out to grab onto the tree of life that grew there, in her grasp were branches, fruits and seeds of all kinds of plants. These she scattered onto the new ground and carefully tended each one until the world turned from brown to green. Sunlight streamed through a hole from the sky world, allowing the seeds to flourish. Wild grasses 
flowers, trees, and medicines spread everywhere, and now that the animals too had plenty to eat, many came to live with her on Turtle Island. Our stories say that of all the plants, Wingashk, or sweetgrass, was the very first to grow on the earth, its fragrance a sweet memory of Skywoman's hand. Accordingly, it is honored as one of the four sacred plants of my people. Breathe in its scent, and you start to remember things you didn't know you'd forgotten. Our elders say that ceremonies are the way we remember to remember, and so sweetgrass is a powerful ceremonial plant cherished by many indigenous nations. It is also used to make beautiful baskets. Both medicine and a relative, its value is both material and spiritual. There is such tenderness in braiding the hair of someone you love. Kindness and something more flow between the braider and the braided, the two connected by the cord of the plate. Wingashk waves in strands, long and shining like a woman's freshly washed hair, and so we say it is the flowing hair of Mother Earth. When we braid sweetgrass, we are braiding the hair of Mother Earth, showing her our loving attention, our care for her beauty and well-being, and gratitude for all she has given us. Children hearing the Sky Woman story from birth know in their bones the responsibility that flows between humans and the Earth. The story of Sky Woman's journey is so rich and glittering it feels to me like a deep bowl of celestial blue from which I could drink again and again. It holds our beliefs, our history, our relationships. Looking into that starry bowl, I see images swirling so fluidly that the past and the present become as one. Images of Sky Woman speak not just of where we came from, but also of how we can go forward. I have Bruce King's portrait of Sky Woman, moment in flight, hanging in my lab. Floating to earth with her handful of seeds and flowers, she looks down on my microscopes and data loggers. It might seem an odd juxtaposition, but to me, she belongs there. As a writer, a scientist, and a carrier of Sky Woman's story, I sit at the feet of my elder teachers, listening for their songs. On Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 9.35 a.m., I am usually in a lecture hall at the university, expounding about botany and ecology, trying, in short, to explain to my students how Sky Woman's gardens, known by some as global ecosystems, function. One otherwise unremarkable morning, I gave the students in my general ecology class a survey. Among other things, they were asked to rate their understanding of the negative interactions between humans and the environment. Nearly every one of the 200 students said confidently that humans and nature are a bad mix. These were third-year students who had selected a career in environmental protection, so the response was in a way not very surprising. They were well-schooled in the mechanics of climate change, toxins in the lead and water, and the crisis of habitat loss. Later, in the survey, they were asked to rate their knowledge of positive interactions between people and land. The median response was, none. I was stunned. How is it possible that in 20 years of education they cannot think of any beneficial relationships between people and the environment? Perhaps the negative examples they see every day, brown fields, factory farms, suburban sprawl, truncated their ability to see some good between humans and the earth. As the land becomes impoverished, so too does the scope of their vision. When we talked about this after class, I realized that they could not even imagine what beneficial relations between their species and others might look like. How can we begin to move toward ecological and cultural sustainability if we cannot even imagine what the path feels like? if we cannot imagine the generosity of geese. These students were not raised on the story of Sky Woman. On one side of the world were people whose relationship with the living world was shaped by Sky Woman, who created a garden for the well-being of all. On the other side was another woman with a garden and a tree, but for tasting its fruit she was banished from the garden and the gates clanged shut behind her. That mother of men was made to wander in the wilderness and earn her bread by the sweat of her brow, not by filling her mouth with the sweet, juicy fruits that bend the branches low. In order to eat, she was instructed to subdue the wilderness into which she was cast. 
same species, same earth, different stories. Like creation stories everywhere, cosmologies are a source of identity and orientation to the world. They tell us who we are. We are inevitably shaped by them, no matter how distant they may be from our consciousness. One story leads to the generous embrace of the living world, the other to banishment. One woman is our ancestral gardener, a co-creator of the good, green world that would be home to her descendants. The other was an exile, just passing through an alien world on a rough road to her real home in heaven. And then they met, the offspring of Skywoman and the children of Eve, and the land around us bears the scars of that meeting, the echoes of our stories. They say that hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, and I can only imagine the conversation between Eve and Skywoman. Sister, you got the short end of the stick. The Skywoman story, shared by the original peoples throughout the Great Lakes, is a constant star in the constellation of teachings we call the original instructions. These are not instructions like commandments, though, or rules. Rather, they're like a compass. They provide an orientation, but not a map. The work of living is creating that map for yourself. How to follow the original instructions will be different for each of us, and different for every era. In their time, Skywoman's first people lived by their understandings of the original instructions, with ethical prescriptions for respectful hunting, family life, ceremonies that made sense for their world. Those measures for caring might not seem to fit in today's urban world, where green means an advertising slogan, not a meadow. The buffalo are gone and the world has moved on. I can't return salmon to the river, and my neighbors would raise the alarm if I set fire to my yard to produce the pasture for elk. The earth was new then, when it welcomed the first human. It's old now, and some suspect that we have worn out our welcome by casting the original instructions aside. From the very beginning of the world, the other species were a lifeboat for the people. Now we must be theirs, but the stories that might guide us, if they are told at all, grow dim in the memory. What meaning would they have today? How can we translate from the stories at the world's beginning to this hour so much closer to its end? The landscape has changed, but the story remains, and as I turn it over again and again, Skywoman seems to look me in the eye and ask, in return for this gift of a world on Turtle's back, what will I give in return? It is good to remember that the original woman was herself an immigrant. She fell a long way from her home in the sky world, leaving behind all who knew her and who held her dear. She could never go back. Since 1492, most here are immigrants as well, perhaps arriving on Ellis Island without even knowing that Turtle Island rested beneath their feet. Some of my ancestors are Skywoman's people, and I belong to them. Some of my ancestors were the newer kind of immigrants, too. A French fur trader, an Irish carpenter, a Welsh farmer. And here we all are on Turtle Island, trying to make a home. Their stories of arrivals with empty pockets and nothing but hope resonate with Skywoman's. She came here with nothing but a handful of seeds and the slimmest of instructions to use your gifts and dreams for good, the same instructions we all carry. She accepted the gifts from the other beings with open hands and used them honorably. She shared the gifts she brought from Skyworld as she set herself about the business of flourishing, of making a home. Perhaps the Skywoman story endures because we too are always falling. Our lives both personal and collective, share her trajectory. Whether we jump or are pushed, or the edge of the known world just crumbles at our feet, we fall, spinning into someplace new and unexpected. Despite our fears of falling, the gifts of the world stand by to catch us. As we consider these instructions, it's also good to recall that when Skywoman arrived here, she did not come alone. She was pregnant, Knowing her grandchildren would inherit the world she left behind, she did not work for flourishing in her time only. It was through her actions of reciprocity, the give and take with the land, that the original immigrant became indigenous. For all of us, becoming indigenous to a place means living as if your children's future mattered, 
to take care of the land as if our lives, both material and spiritual, depended on it. In the public arena, I've heard the Skywoman story told as a bauble of colorful folklore. But even when it's misunderstood, there is power in the telling. Most of my students have never heard the origin story of this land where they were born, but when I tell them, something begins to kindle behind their eyes. Can they, can we all understand the Skywoman story not as an artifact from the past, but as instructions for the future? Can a nation of immigrants once again follow her example to become native, to make a home? Look at the legacy of poor Eve's exile from Eden. The land shows the bruises of an abusive relationship. It's not just the land that is broken, but more importantly, our relationship to land. As Gary Nauman has written, we can't meaningfully proceed with healing, with restoration, without restoriation. In other words, our relationship with land cannot heal until we hear its stories. But who will tell them? In the Western tradition, there is a recognized hierarchy of beings, with, of course, the human being on top, pinnacle of evolution, the darling of creation, and the plants at the bottom. But in native ways of knowing, human people are often referred to as the younger brothers of creation. We say that humans have the least experience with how to live, and thus, the most to learn. We must look to our teachers among the other species for guidance. Their wisdom is apparent in the way that they live. They teach us by example. They've been on the earth far longer than we have been, and have had time to figure things out. They live both above and below ground, joining sky world to the earth. Plants know how to make food and medicine from light and water, and then they give it away. I like to imagine that when Sky Woman scattered her handful of seeds across Turtle Island, she was sowing sustenance for the body and also for the mind, emotion and spirit. She was leaving us teachers. The plants can tell us her story. We need to learn and to listen.